Lakeland Public Television presents Currents with host Ray Gildow. Sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service, offering tax preparation for individuals and businesses across from the City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello again everyone and welcome to Lakeland Currents. Uh, today we're going to be talking about an issue that affects all of us whether or not we are thinking about it. If we're driving down the highway, if you're in a grocery store, if you're in a neighborhood, it's something that can happen, that can affect you, and that is the world of drugs. And today we're going to be getting a regional perspective from my guests, uh, who are both from Wadena County, by the way, but they have worked in a larger area and they have a fair amount of background in this area. Uh, um, to my right, immediate right, is Melissa Ber Berkholz, who is the Chief of Police for the Staples Police Department. And to her right, in the white, is Mike Carr, who is the Sheriff for Wadena County. Welcome both of you to Lakeland Currents. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Maybe you could just, we could start out by getting a little background about you folks. Uh, Melissa, what's your background? I, I, I do know you're a Staples graduate. So. I am a Staples grad. I grew up in the area and stayed there. And I started out as a part-time officer with the Staples Police Department and worked up to a full-time position. And then I was appointed as a sergeant and then the chief. And, and so where did you actually go to your law enforcement training? To Central Lakes College in Brainerd. Oh, and, good choice. And, Very and good choice. And then also to Hibbing for my skills. So, sure. Yep. And, and Mike, I know you're a second generation law enforcement. Yep. Mike Carr, senior, is your father. Yep. Um, what's your background? I, uh, I, I graduated from Wadena High School and uh, went to CLC, got my two-year degree there, and then Bemidji State University. And then I, Hibbing's where I did my skills. Um, been fortunate to have a, a pretty, uh, you know, start my 22nd year in law enforcement here in, in Wadena County, but I've uh, been able to work in a lot of various different areas, Crow Wing County, Baxter Police Department, and uh, pretty much every police department in Wadena County at one time or another. And, and Melissa, how long did you say you've been in the business now? 16 years. 16 years, yep. wow. You've seen a lot of changes in your short careers. I mean, I look at it as short as being under 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of changes in this whole area of drugs, yes. and I think the, the, one of the debates that's occurring in most states right now is the medical marijuana debate, mm -hmm. whether that's a good thing or not. Uh, some states like Colorado, I think, and I'm not sure if it's Washington, but there's a few states that have legalized marijuana, and I see there is a definite uptick now in car crashes related to some of these things, and th so that's a little bit scary. Um, you also are involved with a drug task force, um, and you've been doing, you've been, I would, who's on this drug task force? Is this a county level or is it a regional level task force? Wadena County is part of the West Central Drug Task Force, and then uh, with that I have a deputy sheriff who is a special agent that is on the West Central Drug Task Force assigned to that area. Um, and basically it's, a, it's made up of a various uh, counties in our region. And, uh, and then he also works mainly the Wadena County area. So is this something that one would find statewide? Are there dra dr uh, drug task force in most counties? Absolutely, yeah. A lot of, lot of counties, are. Uh, there's various different uh, drug task forces and stuff. BCA also has their own, you got your DEA and stuff like that. But yeah, the, uh, most counties are uh, connected to some type of drug task force. In Wadena County, we're West Central, and Todd County is um, Central, Central Minnesota. Minnesota. And they're mostly multi-jurisdictional task forces where several counties will assign an agent or a deputy to the task force to work together. And they kind of know their area, but they are fluid enough to work the other areas within the task force. I had Neil Dickinson on here a, uh, a week ago, who was the information officer for the Minnesota State Patrol. Mm -hmm. And I said, one of the things that you folks as, as law enforcement are doing now that is a little confusing to me, and that is when you pull someone over in the old days, we were told to get out, but now you're asking people to stay in their vehicles. And he said, well, the most important thing for people is yes, stay in your vehicles and also have your identification and your license uh, information for your insurance available, but have your hands where we can see them. And my thought is that it must be petrifying when you pull up on a vehicle, you never really know if that person is normal or if that person's high on drugs, um, that's pretty frightening first few moments, isn't it? Yes. It is, and I know 
uh, with our new hires and people going through schooling and thing, we you know it's an area that we cover a lot in officer safety techniques and things to watch for. And over time, you know there gets to be new trends in places to hide things or things that people do, and so you got to kind of stay on top of that to make sure that your officers are safe and also still doing their I, job I, I courteously. I had something happen to me that sort of was frightening too. Uh, this would be a couple years ago now. I was driving on Highway 200 east of Walker, and there was an old station wagon driving down the road in front of me. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I looked, and there were like three patrol cars, lights blaring behind me. So I pulled over. I thought maybe they were checking me out or something. And they pulled right around me and pulled this guy over. And two more patrol cars came from the other direction, and they all surrounded him and jumped out with their guns. And I'm thinking. This is my last day here. I mean, you just don't really know. But yeah. I read in the paper the next day that he was a drug lord. He was someone who, who they had information on, and they were tracking him down, and they caught him. Um, boy, you think about all the people and all the incidents we've had this past year with law enforcement. I don't think people realize how frightening your job has become. Mm -hmm. It's not a DWI is one thing when somebody gets out of the, of the car and they're falling on the ground and they can't even talk to you. But when they're delusional and having these kinds of issues, that's really making your job tougher, isn't it? Yeah. It is. So for a long time, c give us a little history of the drug issue in, in, our, in our area. Well, you know, I can remember, um, I remember our first lab in Wadena County was back in the in probably about the mid 90s you know when you say lab lab uh, methamphetamine labs you know um, before that I mean we just we never seen it and and that's when we really started no taking notice on what was going on um, anyways this lab was uh, there was a active lab that we took down in Blueberry Township in the northern part of our county and uh, you know uh, not a lot of people were real familiar in our area about methamphetamine labs, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. back in those days. And uh, when we, uh, you know, as time went on, those labs just started increasing more and more. Our SWAT teams uh, were being activated a lot more because they are high risk search warrants and stuff like that, that you're, you're, when you're dealing with people that are uh, using and, and uh, cooking and stuff. but. Uh, as time went on, uh, we end up, uh, I think on average, we combined with the Wadena Hubbard County SWAT team, uh, are combined together, I think we were taking at least two uh, high-risk search warrants a month. And then, of course, legislation uh, passed the law about pseudofedrin behind the counters. And, you know, statewide, and that, and that just didn't help, uh, you know, that was through our region statewide, but also United States-wide, is it's, uh, you start seeing a decrease in methamphetamine labs. You know, the best way I can explain pseudofedrin, uh, Ray, is that it's kind of like baking a cake. If you don't have flour, you can't bake a cake, and, and that's really what uh, helped law enforcement in general of when they put pseudofedrin behind the counters where you have to produce your driver's license, you know, um, and they allow you only so many uh, packets. Uh, and it takes, you know, back in the day, it was usually about a thousand uh, pills of pseudofedrin to make a batch of meth. Um, so that really, we've seen a huge decrease and then we started seeing that meth uh, kind of going down around our area. Uh, and then unfortunately, it, it started to come back up again, uh, coming from, a lot of it was coming from Mexico. Uh, some of the stuff we were getting out of um, the Canadian area, but a lot of the stuff, was, about 90% of the stuff we're seeing right now is coming from Mexico. How, how are they getting through the borders? You know, it, it, it's coming in. El Chapo, in, I know that yeah. was one person. I know they had tunnels. Yeah, actually went under our borders. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. You know, it's just it's one of those things. It's uh, that they have to tighten up our borders, obviously. Um, but it, it's it's a drug that just seems to filter in through our borders. Um, I know one of our biggest busts that we just took down here in, in the last year in the Wadena area was a. Uh, a box that came out of, from FedEx, you know, and they were able to detect the dog hit on it uh, there, but they were trying to wrap it in spices and trying to, uh, you know, so the dog wouldn't hit on it. But uh, that was a, uh, uh, came out of uh, the Mesa, Arizona area. Wow. So. so a lot of our drugs now are not from local production, but they're coming from yeah. other places, Canada or Mexico. There's very few methamphetamine <clears throat> labs still occurring, and the ones that are are 
the real small kind of one pot mm -hmm. method of cooking meth. It's not the big methamphetamine labs of the late 90s, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And it's just easier and cheaper to haul it in, in large quantities from Mexico and, and get it that way. So how much do you see of the other drugs, uh, the marijuana and the cocaine in, in the region? You know, I, we still, you know, obviously marijuana is still probably one of the more popular uh, drugs around our area, uh, throughout the region, the state, and stuff like that. Um, you know, heroin's on the rise. That's something that's uh, we're starting to see. Uh, we have two uh, highway corridors that come through our county, um, and uh, though it hasn't, you know, it's coming here. It's kind of like that that storm that you see uh, moving, uh, you know, really heavy out in the East Coast area and stuff. The bikers. Uh, out in that area, um, but uh, we're starting to see uh, the heroin coming in. It's and these people, it's it's business for them, so they look at ways to get into the field, and so what they'll do is they'll flood the market with cheap, high-quality heroin to get the people hooked on it, and then increase the price and decrease the product as time goes on. Wow. And it's, it's, it's around, it's coming. There's certain areas around our immediate area that are severely affected by it and it's definitely I think one of the more devastating drugs because of the potential for overdose and the fact that a lot of the heroin coming into the area now is laced with fentanyl and other drugs that in small doses that somebody might have used 10 times before could kill them because of the toxic mixture wow. of what they're mixing in with the heroin and I was telling you on the radio what coming in this morning uh, I heard them saying that the average methane, methadone user, methane, is it methane or methadone? Are they two different things? Or Met meth methamphetamines. Yeah. Yep. Uh, their lifespan is about five years. Mm -hmm. um, and that's young people. And, mm -hmm. and I've seen these photos of people who are using it regularly. They lose their teeth and they lose mm -hmm. their hair. And you just wonder how do people get started? And you, you made yeah. the comment earlier, Mike, before we went on air, that to get this extreme high mm -hmm. the first time they do this, then yeah. it probably will never be that high again. They're just always trying to reach that high again, and they, that's why you know, they, they use more and more of it. You know, um, we've seen, uh, I think everybody is affected, or somebody, you know somebody throughout your lifetime that's probably you, seen them addicted to methamphetamine, but the one thing that's so noticeable, and, and meth just eats you from the inside out, yeah, um, we've seen those pictures of, uh, I remember a gal over a 20 year span or a 15 year span of using methamphetamine and just to see how her, which her appearance was to where it was towards the end, I mean it looked like it just aged her like, mm -hmm. tw you know, incredibly. Mm -hmm. um, so it does, it's, it's, it's a drug that just seems to really suck the life out of you and uh, obviously it starts affecting your hygiene, your teeth and everything else and of course uh, on the expensive end for the uh, taxpayers, you know, they these people land themselves in jail. Of course, um, their teeth, uh, they need to go to the dentist and stuff like that because the pain that, that's caused by it. And, uh, you know, you get a lot of times too, though, you see the meth bites, you know, where you'll start seeing them they scratch and they feel like they got, you know, um, bugs underneath their skin and they'll scratch it to the point where it starts bleeding and stuff. But uh, pretty noticeable. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you can see, you tell the difference when they when they're at an all time high is when they're tweaking. You know, and and uh, what, uh, what do you mean when they're tweaking? Tweaking. It's basically when when they're at the all time high of, of meth is when they basically they're, they're uncontrollable their gestures and stuff like that. Um, noticeable. You know, law enforcement we deal with it a lot more, so we see it. But uh, you know, it's pretty common. If you could, I've seen people when you're you're in a store or something, you can just tell. Um, so you have trained yourselves to be able to recognize users just by absolutely. their physical characteristics? Yep. A yeah. lot of drugs, and specifically methamphetamine, it's pretty easy to spot people, and sometimes it might take a little while, but eventually the ticks or the scratching or the hmm. extreme paranoia and things like that, they come out, they can't be hidden <coughs> permanently, and mm -hmm. there's some people that can function somewhat for a short period of time once they become an addict. and eventually you know they can't hold down a job they can't pay their bills they're homeless so now they're stealing they're prostituting they're doing things to make money 
to when buy they, the drug. Some of them had children. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's a whole <clears throat> other aspect of it is that the extreme cost to society and to counties and governments to pay for the human services side of it. Not only that, most of these homes that have children end up having the children put into placement, foster care, things like that at a huge taxpayer expense, but also the treatment and the mental health aspects that go into the addict themselves, trying to send these addicts who don't have jobs or in sources of income through treatments and, and medical treatments, things like that, chemical dependency treatment, and they have no way to pay for it themselves, so it's it's a constant drain to the taxpayer. To the taxpayer. And, and it costs, <clears throat> It costs everyone because when these people are addicts and they need the money, they're doing burglaries and they're doing these things. So now, now it's costing everybody, and that's why you know there's some argument about about enforcement. But you look at it and you see that, for instance, having Wadena County have an active drug task force agent, and the amount of crime that has dropped just in Wadena County as an example, because you're clamping down on the problem, the drug problem mostly methamphetamine but other drugs as well and so you're seeing a reduction in burglaries and you're seeing a reduction in property crimes things like that that you can directly correlate to the fact that you're taking the drugs away from these people and enforcing that stuff so it's it it affects everybody in some mm -hmm. some manner even if you don't directly know somebody you're you're affected as a taxpayer, as a taxpayer everybody is affected by it what your your task force started in 2015, I believe, is what you have here. Yep. Tell us what the task force does. Well, uh, our, obviously, we have an agent that's on there, uh, deputy sheriff from what so county. Do you have one agent for one, the county? For yep, we have a, one deputy, um, but he works with uh, because we're the West Central. There, we pull from other agencies, um, just like vice versa. If there's a case in Becker County that our drug task force needs to go work with, he will go over and assist them too. So um, I think the numbers are right around between six to eight agents at any given time that are active in the West Central Drug Task Force. But uh, you know, since we started our drug task force team, we've seen a huge, um, we've made 63 felony arrests in the last year and a half. 63? 63. Um, some of the things that we've uh, we've seized over 2,800 uh, grams of methamphetamine, which is close to about a pound of meth, uh, which is a street value of about $282,000. Wow. Uh, that's huge. Um, and the thing is, like uh, the chief was saying, um, these people, well, one of the things is, is that these people are stealing and they're burglarizing and stuff like that. And uh, that's how they get their fix because they don't, they're not capable of having jobs or holding down jobs. Um, so that's how, um, you know, basically where we, you end up. I mean, mm -hmm. you end up in the, and of course, not only do we see our, we've seen a, a decrease in our burglars and thefts in Wadena County, but we've also seen a decrease in the number of salts that we have. Um, so we're seeing, the one thing that is up is the number of drug cases we're doing. Um, also, we have a higher number of child protection cases. So when your task force finds someone who's selling drugs, uh, you take them to court, prosecute them, typically what, what are the first offense um, sentences? What happens to them usually the first time? Well, they, they basically, they plead guilty or not guilty. They come up in their first appearance in court. Um, then, of course, the judge will um, set down whether it's a bail or not. You know, it, it just depends. Every case is different. You know, it depends mm -hmm. on the, the volume of it. But uh, usually they will set a bail amount. For so some of them still do get back out on the streets, but some of yeah. them end up going to jail. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when you said that um, you've got some size samples there of yeah. drugs. Could you share that a little with us? Because I think a yeah. lot of people have a hard time understanding what a gram yeah. is. And just so we know, this is a sugar in here that we, no, we have in here. You're not carrying around the, the stuff, but uh, <laughs> this is kind of what a, a what a Ray, what a gram of meth is. That's a gram. Yeah, this is a gram, like a sugar packet that you would see in right, a, I just yep, look at yep, that yep. And uh, that's There's not very much in there. Yep. And if you took that as a person who never has taken it before, yep. How long would some effects of this last? Do you have any idea? Well, you know, it depends. You know, there's times when the, some of these people, they don't sleep for days on end. I mean, From you, that much? Yep, yeah, yeah. They can keep going. The, oh, uh, days without sleep? Yep. yep. Wow. Yep. And, and that's when you get a lot of the extreme behavior that is kind of the stereotypical mm -hmm. meth addict behavior, the extreme paranoia, um, 
agitation, ex extreme aggression, you can get a lot of, of your assaults and, mm. and robberies and things like that occur yeah. once these people have been up for days. And, and and what, what, just so we, I, I was gonna tell you too, Ray, but something like this in, in our area, in our region, goes for about $50. $50? $50. Wow. And so, um, and I just wanna point out those prices to you, but uh, the next one here is uh, 3.5 grams, also commonly known on the street as an eight ball. Um, but this is uh, this is a three hundred fifty dollars. Three hundred fifty dollars. Yeah. What? How does that term eight ball come about? Do you have any idea? It's 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 just a street. Just a street bit. term. Yep. It's been around wow. for three hundred fifty grams. Yeah. And some what if someone were a user regularly? How long would something like this last? You know, everybody's different. Okay. I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, every everybody's uh, just different in how they adjust to use the meth. And but you of course, see, obviously, right? somebody that uses it quite often, you know, it could it could last them. A day it could last them three days. You know what I mean? It could last them a and couple you can see weeks. Why you know, it'd be but pretty easy to hide this yep. stuff, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yep. <clears throat> And then the the other one here is uh, this is a uh, ounce, which is twenty eight grams, and this has a street value of eighteen hundred dollars. Wow. So. And that you know, as things like this come into our area, we also have to make sure that our officers are aware of different new ways of hiding things so we always have to stay on top of concealment methods you know they make pop cans that unscrew shaving can creams you know you can fill spare tires there's all kinds of methods that they use to conceal this because they don't want Just, to get caught there's a lot of innovative ways that these people hide a lot their of money at stake yeah, yeah yep yep you know and the thing is is that uh you know, there's some of the times, some of the best, uh, you know, the hardest drug dealers that we've ever taken down don't use methamphetamine. Really? You know, and they're tougher to get caught and they only deal with just so certain So they're people. just the dealers, but yep. they know enough to stay away from it? Yep. yep. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So Let's talk a little bit about how they ingest this into their bodies. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's a couple, few different ways that they can do it. They can obviously ingest it through their mouth and, and but uh, the most common one is smoking it. They use a glass pipe, real similar to this one here. Um, but that's the glass pipe that they would use uh, to uh, smoke methamphetamine. They heat it up, um, and then of course they use it through uh, needle use as well. Um, Snorting. Yep, and they, I think the needle use is another common way they call it is banging, and that's probably one of the, when you get to that point, that's a pretty heavy user and right there. Another yeah, and this, product there that's pretty yeah, this is just a common one. Garages. This is like your, your marijuana type Pipes and, and this stuff is just and, for uh, blowing up yeah, tires. Blowing up tires. Yep. Yep. The tire gauge. So or valve rather. Yep. So they would put it in there and then yep. they would smoke, smoke it, it through light here. it up. Yep. Wow. So. And does that stuff smolder when it's lit? Yep. Yep. You know, and, and the thing is, is that you know, it's it's amazing some of the things we've seen over the years. Um, I I, I can tell you back when the days when we had uh, we seized uh, uh, 80 acres up in Huntersville State Forest in our county. And I remember um, the guy, he was a, he was a cooker, he a meth cooker up there. And you know, we had those, a lot of times we'd have tanks that were stolen from various co-ops and stuff. And this guy uh, had stolen an anhydrous tank was part of their mixture, and, but he had stolen this tank and he buried it partially in the ground and camouflaged it and basically just so the planes wouldn't catch it and stuff up in the air. But uh, yeah, he was, had a pretty elaborate lab system set up Wow. So, I mean, we've seen a lot of things back in the days when there was the labs were at an all-time high. Very dangerous, though. You know, they're very explosive, vol very volatile and stuff. But, uh, you know, things have changed where we're not seeing those labs, but now we're seeing, I mean, the meth is still here. It's, it's I would, I don't know. I don't know necessarily if I'd say it's at an all-time high, but it's it's but still it's pretty, act it's pretty active. Yeah. Wow. And obviously this has a big impact in families big yes. impact with kids mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and typically if one parent is doing it are they both doing it or is that just case by case well I think it, it's case by pay case and a lot of these are broken mm -hmm. homes already so maybe the mother or father who has the children are with different people at different times but typically if you're in a household where it's being used it's being used by the adults in the household and and even if it's not, if it's just the one, it's still extreme concern for the child protection side of things and 
you know, we see it, I, the vast majority of the child protection cases we do are directly related to methamphetamine mm -hmm. and, or at least drugs, <coughs> but, but specifically for, at least for my city, it's methamphetamine and, and so these kids aren't getting properly cared for, they're not getting fed, they're not getting bathed, they're not getting to school and, mm -hmm. you know, there's certain checks along the way that allow us to make contact with them and get them into the services that they need, but they're still exposed to this and they're exposed to the smoke and the behaviors of their parents or the adults they're with when they're using. And and that, of course, trickles down, down the road when these kids are growing up and they, what they don't know to be normal is not what they should have been How, how much of to. this are you seeing in the high schools? In the high schools, at, at least for our schools, the meth, it's there, but it's not a prevalent thing. Marijuana is so, kids are, even society as a general I think is so desensitized to marijuana now and I think that that's it's pretty common to to find that or find that kids have used that in high schools I would say that marijuana and prescription drugs are the most prevalent drugs in the school I we haven't seen we've had a little bit of heroin and a little bit of meth coming out of the high schools but for the m most part I would say it's marijuana and prescription mm -hmm. pills in the in the high schools. So looking at your statistics, your burglaries are down 13%, your theft is down 5%, your domestic abuse is down 11%, child welfare is up 25%, which means you're taking those kids out of those environments. Mm -hmm. Assaults are down 11%, and a narcotic investigation is up by 52 cases. It would seem that you're making some progress. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I you know, yeah, I want to give a lot of credit to our drug task force agent. I think that the, the stats have changed. He does he does a, a bang up job in what he's doing out here, um, but obviously, it, we're a team out here, and, and everything from the boots on the ground, the guys that are doing the patrol work, um, they're getting that information because um, without their information, um, our drug task force agent can't do his. And that's how a lot of you get your informants and stuff like that through just your basic traffic stops. And, and that's what the chief was uh, talking about earlier. Um, proactive uh, traffic stops uh, are the way to go with law enforcement, how we do business. And, and uh, that's you know, you, a small amount of marijuana. And I, I used to, I, I worked the um, drug world back in the day when I was uh, a deputy. and. Um, did child protection, but the things I, I seen when I was doing those cases back in the day were um, you'd get a small amount of marijuana and next thing you know you're getting making four or five arrests out of that. Wow. And it's pretty incredible. The child protection cases I did for 10 years before I became sheriff and um, it was always real disheartening uh, when you get to a house and you know basically you'd see a, a bowl of cereal um, or a, a, a basically a box of cereal some milk in the fridge, always a pizza box, and uh, you know, um, a liter of pop, you know what I mean? Wow. That was kind of the... I'm out of time. Okay. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come here, and uh, good luck with this task force. I think it's really important work that you're doing, and uh, we'll keep in touch, maybe have you back again a little later on and see how it's going. Okay. Right. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you. Thank you. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow, so long until next time. Thank you.